Hello there, this is World News Program, streaming to you live on all 24 news from Algiers. I'm your host, Kirin Fazakari, and up next are the top stories. Over 40 Palestinians were killed in five Zionist massacres in just 24 hours. Occupation bombings ravaged the Nusayrat camp, a Rafah residence, and a Jabalia mosque, leaving dozens dead and wounded. Occupation forces have launched an invasion of Beit Hanun targeting displaced residents in the area. Their efforts also extend to clearing Beit Hanun and eastern Jabalia of Palestinian inhabitants. That's next. Also coming up, a UN reporter confirms Zionist occupation guilty of genocide crimes in Gaza with intent to eradicate Palestinians. And mass graves are unearthed posing health and environmental disaster for hundreds of thousands in the Strip. Also ahead, Algerian president meets Sahrawi counterpart. UN Security Council consults on Minorso mission and Polisario Front reaffirms Sahrawi right to self-determination. Stay tuned, the details are right after the break. Hello again and welcome to the program. First off in our news, in the last 24 hours, Zionist occupation forces carried out five massacres in the Gaza Strip, resulting in the deaths of 46 Palestinians and injuring 110 others. The government media office in Gaza reported that since the start of the Zionist aggression in last October, the death toll has reached 33,843, with the majority being women and children. Additionally, seven or 76,575 have been injured, with thousands still trapped under rubble and on roads as occupation forces obstruct access for ambulance and civil defense crews. Zionist airstrikes in Gaza City's Tufah neighborhood killed seven police officers and bystanders. The attack targeted a police vehicle during a routine mission condemned by Gaza's government information office. In Rafah, high house bombing left four dead, including a child. Additionally, airstrikes in the Nusayrat camp killed at least three Palestinians and wounded many more. In Jabalia, north of the Gaza Strip, several Palestinians were killed and others injured as Zionist occupation aircraft bombed the mosque in the camp. According to the Palestinian news agency, casualties were taken to Kamal Adwan Hospital after Al Fakura Mater's mosque was targeted as well. Meanwhile, communication and internet services were also cut off during the incursion. <laughs> Additionally, occupation forces entered Beit Hanun, north of Gaza, surrounding a school, sheltering displaced people and opening fire. Zionist forces targeting shelter centers, housing over 3,000 displaced people. The incursion aims to evacuate the area with reports of arrests, forced displacement and humiliating treatment inflicted on residents. <laughs> The number of refugees inside these centers is 3,000. Some of them were able to exit the camps, and they reported what they witnessed as the Zionist forces invaded a school. That is shelter for refugees, and some of them were arrested. The occupation forces ordered the refugees to be in the courtyard of the school, and they are being investigated until these moments. Every now and then we can hear the sound of bombardment and gunfire in this region. 
في هذه المنطقة. The Gaza Strip's government media office reported on Tuesday that Zionist occupation forces are aiming to depopulate Beit Hanun and the eastern region of Jabalia in the northern strip. Salama Maruf, the office's head, stated that all families in Beit Hanun were forced to leave, with several young men arrested during the recent ground invasion. In a new crime against our people, the occupation seeks to evacuate Beit Hanun and the eastern areas of Jabalia in northern Gaza. Last night, occupation forces carried out a military operation, advancing with their bulldozers and tanks towards the shelters in Beit Hanun. All families in Beit Hanun were forced to evacuate, and a number of young people were arrested. In another development, Francesca Albanez, the United Nations reporter for human rights in the Palestinian territories, affirmed that Zionist occupation forces have indeed committed at least three acts of genocide in Gaza. Speaking from Amman during a press conference to discuss her report submitted to the Human Rights Council, Albanez highlighted that over 14,500 children have been killed in Gaza by the occupation, with more than 250 Palestinians killed daily. I appeal to all countries of the world to prevent further casualties in Gaza. Israel has committed at least three genocide crimes in Gaza so far, and all remaining means of life are a target of Israel to destroy. The crimes of genocide continue and Israel brazenly denies the facts and is working to unpack the evidence of its crimes. Palestinian society is facing genocide and the West is practicing double standards regarding what is happening in Gaza. Israel has systematically eliminated livelihoods in the Gaza Strip and used residents as human shields. The UN reporter for human rights in Palestinian territories also confirmed that Zionist occupation's actions demonstrate a systematic intent to destroy Palestinians as a group. Israel destroyed Gaza within five months of military operations, the horrific number of deaths, the irreparable damage of the survivors, the systematic destruction of every aspect necessary for the continuation of life in Gaza, from hospitals to schools, from homes to arable land, and the special damage which affects hundreds of thousands of children, pregnant mothers and girls, can only be interpreted as continuing prima facie evidence of the intention to systematically destroy the Palestinians as a group. Palestinians in Gaza, aided by medical teams, continue to uncover bodies of martyrs executed by Zionist forces in a mass grave at the Shifa medical complex. More with Osama Yadi now. Harrowing scenes of a mass grave were discovered on Monday within the premises of a Shifa medical complex in the Gaza city. The grave contains the bodies of Palestinians executed by the Zionist army during its military assault at the hospital. We are conducting a rescue operation to retrieve these decomposed bodies from under the rubble. Some time has passed since their discovery. Despite our limited resources, we are working under extremely difficult and complex conditions. The government media office released a video showing the mass grave located in the international courtyard of Al Shifa Hospital, containing 10 bodies. These bodies were buried during the two week long military assault by the Zionist army at the end of March. Some locals are present here to identify the decomposed bodies. However, some bodies are almost unrecognizable due to decay and decomposition. Therefore, we at the civil defense are working diligently to recover these bodies from Shifa Hospital and hand them over to their families for burial and manage the handling of these remains. Medical sources revealed that alongside the 10 bodies found in the courtyard, dozens more were discovered in various states of decomposition, some burned or mutilated. These bodies were buried either collectively or individually in different parts of the hospital's courtyards. I'm here after being contacted by the relevant agencies because my mother, who was present before the recent attack on the Shifa medical complex, was in critical condition and had been brought to the hospital. Specialized teams are currently engaged in ongoing searches within the mass grave and surrounding areas of the hospital. As of now, the exact number of bodies buried remains indeterminable due to the complex conditions. 
Palestinian civil defense teams have recovered the bodies of more than 400 people since the Zionist troops withdrew from Al-Shifa Hospital and the southern city of Khan Yunis as the hospital's main surgical building, ICU, emergency, general surgery and orthopedic departments have all been extensively damaged or destroyed. And in Beit Lahia, Palestinians found 20 decomposing bodies under sand mounds created by Zionist forces. The bodies, likely of the Lassa family, were handcuffed, blindfolded and stripped before burial, suggesting execution after torture. Occupation bulldozers later crushed their bodies, forming a berm covered with sand, resembling a tank barn. Gaza's government media office warns of an imminent health and environmental crisis for over 700,000 Palestinians in the Northern Strip due to pollution from waste accumulation and decomposing bodies. Here's Zahra Farjani with the report. Since the beginning of the Zionist airstrikes on the Gaza Strip, basic services have been disrupted, including the collection of garbage. Residents of Deir al-Balah, packed with thousands of displaced from the north, are concerned about the consequences that pollution can have on their health. The municipality is unable to dispose trash in the city due to the Zionist relentless attacks. In addition to the bombing every day and the sound of explosions, there is garbage, bad smells and diseases that have spread among us. Every week there is someone who gets sick, children and the elderly, because of the smell and the garbage. We were facing a deficit in the service we provide to citizens before the war. So what about today, with these large numbers? Therefore the service will certainly reduce and will not be in the appropriate and desired manner for citizens. It goes without saying that the landscape in Gaza is not only marred by big piles of debris, but also by trash and mass graves of decomposed bodies. Some were victims of direct violence, while others had to be buried hastily in areas spared from the Zionist bombardment. Salama Maruf, head of the government media office, sounds the alarm about serious health and environmental risks for over 700,000 people in northern Gaza. Areas in northern Gaza are experiencing unprecedented health hazards and environmental pollution posing serious health and environmental risks to over 7,000 inhabitants. Additionally, mass graves are occasionally discovered containing the remains of martyrs who fell victim to massacres committed by the occupation in several areas. Attempts to conceal these atrocities include burying the victims among piles of waste or beneath the rubble and debris of public places like schools or hospitals, such as what occurred within the Shifa Medical Complex and Sheikh Zayed Tower School. As though the remaining population of Gaza who managed to survive the Zionist genocide, weren't already burdened. They now have to face the added weight of an imminent environmental catastrophe. Similarly, the Palestinian Ministry of Health in Gaza issued a stark warning of an approaching health catastrophe as electricity generators and remaining hospitals in the Strip are about to stop. In a statement on its official Facebook page, the ministry expressed concern that these generators, which have been running continuously for 93 days since the aggression on Gaza, may stop at any moment. Urgent help is needed to keep the health services running. While the Zionist entity keeps using famine as a war tactic, the World Food Programme urges ceasefire in Gaza to help families who really depend on critical food aid to survive. Salman Asib reports. With the Zionist occupier continuing to float international law and use hunger as a weapon of war, efforts are deployed to divert attention from this crisis, only exacerbating the suffering of thousands facing famine in Gaza. Experts are sounding the alarm declaring this famine to be the worst man-made crisis in almost a century. And importantly, it is uh, succeeding in taking the focus, particularly the media spotlight, off of the Gaza famine and the Gaza f war and the loss of life that is taking place there. And that was very much, I think, what Israel planned to do, which is one of the reasons why when the Iranian operation came to an end, President Biden contacted Netanyahu, the, pre the Prime Minister of Israel, to say, 
uh, you've got the win. This is exactly what you set out to get. Before, the European diplomat Joseph Borrell means no words in this matter, stating that Gaza isn't on the brink of famine, it's already in one, affecting thousands. Meanwhile, the head of the UN World Food Programme issued a warning, stating that the time is running out to prevent famine in northern Gaza and urging immediate ceasefire to avert famine crisis. In the face of such adversity, the reopening of Kemal Ajur Bakery offers a glimpse of resilience and the enduring spirit of people determined to survive against all odds. For the bakeries to resume work is a good thing that makes everybody comfortable. It's a good thing to eat bread. We have suffered a lot when we bought one kilogram of flour for 90 or 100 shekels. This is insane. People don't have money. People are broke. There's no work. The situation is tough. It's extremely difficult. We have gone through tough things only God knows about. The after effects of months of genocide and blocked aid have led to many children dying from hunger and has plunged Gaza into a famine described by European diplomats as a dire humanitarian catastrophe. Urgent action is needed to alleviate the suffering of the people of Gaza. And in a different story, Algerian Foreign Minister Ahmed Attaf is attending ministerial meetings on the Palestinian issue at the United Nations in New York. The Algerian Foreign Ministry stated that Atav's participation is crucial as the International Security Council considers the state of Palestine's full membership in the UN. Mr. Atav will engage in discussion on the youth's role in Mediterranean security challenges and supporting UNRWA. Additionally, he will participate in a General Assembly meeting focusing on sustainable development goals, particularly sustainable energy provision. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez announced that Spain will move towards recognizing the Palestinian state following upcoming United Nations sessions on Palestine's application for full UN membership. Sanchez, speaking at a press conference alongside Portuguese counterpart Luis Montenegro in Madrid, affirmed Spain's commitment to recognize Palestine regardless of the UN outcome, considering it a concrete step. We are talking with a number of states of the European Union, also from outside of the European Union, so that there are few of us who take this step. But in any case, the government of Spain is going to take that step. And in other developments, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi issued a strong warning of a massive and broad retaliation against any actions perceived as threats to Iran's interests. During a phone call with the Emir of Qatar, Raisi described Iran's response to the Zionist entity as successful, aiming to punish it for the recent bombing of Iran's consulate in Damascus. The smallest region against Iran's interests will be met with a massive, widespread and painful response against all its perpetrators. The blind support of Western countries for the Zionist entity is a ground for increasing tension in the region. The targeting of the Iranian consulate in Damascus was evidence of the inability and failure to achieve the goals of the war on Gaza. The UN and the UN Security Council bear responsibility for their failure to stop the crimes of the Zionists in Gaza because they did not condemn the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. Iran's Deputy Foreign Minister, meanwhile, Ali Bagiri, warned of Iran's swift response to any Zionist attack on Iranian interests. Bagheri also labeled the targeting of the Iranian embassy's consular section in Damascus as a strategic mistake. 
Our operation against the Zionist entity has demonstrated our military and defensive capabilities within the framework of self-defense. The Zionist regime must understand that if it commits another mistake, the response will not be delayed for 12 days, nor for days or hours, but within seconds. The Zionists must not make the second mistake, as Iran's reaction will be harsher, stronger and faster. Meanwhile, contrastingly, the United States is gearing up to impose fresh sanctions on Iran following its military action against the Zionist entity. According to Axios, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen stated that the economic tools will be deployed to counter Iran's destabilizing activities. Yellen warned that Iran's actions pose a threat to the Middle East, but stability with potential economic ramifications. She affirmed the U.S.'s intent to leverage sanctions and collaborate with allies in addressing this issue. Algerian President Abdelmajid Taboun met with Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic President Ibrahim Ghali on Tuesday at the Moradia Palace in Algiers. Present at the meeting were officials including the director of the presidential office and the Algerian Army General Chief of Staff of the National People's Army. Discussions entered on diplomatic affairs and included attendees from both Algerian and Sahrawi delegations. Algerian Foreign Minister Ahmed Attaf held talks with UN envoy Stefan de Mistura on Tuesday regarding efforts to revive peace talks in Western Sahara. Mr. Attaf also met with U.S. official Joshua Harris to discuss the latest developments in the region. Later, the U.N. Security Council will hold closed consultations on the situation in Western Sahara with briefings from the Ms. Mistura or de Mistura and Minorso head Alexandro Ivanko. United Nations envoy Abdullah Bathili announced his resignation on Tuesday as head of the United Nations support mission in Libya. During a press conference following his briefing to the UN Security Council on the situation in Libya, Bathili cited frustration stemming from the mission's efforts reaching a deadlock due to the party's intransigence in the country's crisis. Honor of present, yes, I did tender my resignation to the Secretary General and uh, explain for these very reasons. And uh, of course, it's up to the Secretary General to draw the conclusions therefrom. More stories in the news in brief with Sofian Kenturi now. The Special Representative of UN Secretary General, the head of UN Special Mission in Libya, Abdullah Batili, said that there is a deliberate refusal by the Libyan parties to hold the elections, with a stubborn desire to postpone the elections to unknown extent. Batili also announced that the postponement of the Libyan National Reconciliation Conference scheduled to be held on the 28th of April. The Tunisian president stressed that his country will not be a transit or stable for irregular migrants, pointing to the determination of the state to extend its control over all cities and regions of the country. Isaiah stressed the need to invite some foreign ambassadors to urge their countries not to get into internal affairs of Tunisia, adding that anyone who believes in the possibility of extending his guardianship over Tunisia is mistaken. Algeria and Serbia reviewed the ways and prospects of cooperation between the two nations. This came at the reception of the Secretary General of the Algerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Lunas Makerman, the Serbian Secretary of State Ambassador, Goran Alexic, who is conducting a working visit to the country. Chinese President Xi Jinping stressed the need to find a common ground for cooperation with Germany, putting aside differences. She told German Chancellor Olaf Scholz during the meeting in the Chinese capital Beijing that bilateral relations with Berlin will continue to develop steadily as long as they respect each other. Large areas of Asia are experiencing a devastating flood due to unprecedented torrential rains, which have resulted in significant losses of lives property, infrastructure, and ecosystems, especially in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, and Indonesia. And finally, I leave you in with this report about the Athens Olympic Games that whose flame is going to be taken to Paris with Islam said. With just under 100 days remaining until the Paris Olympics kick off, the Olympic flame relay launched from Olympia in Greece. 
signaling the final phase of the seven-year preparation for the Games, set to begin on July 26. The ceremony, amidst a backdrop of heightened international tensions, resonated with messages of hope. In these difficult times we are living through, with wars and conflicts on the rise, people are fed up with all the hate, the aggression, the negative news they are facing day in, day out. In their hearts, and I think in all our hearts, we are longing for something that brings us together. Following its journey through Greece, the flame will be formally transferred to the Paris Games organizers at Athens Panathenaic Stadium, the historic site of the first modern games. Over an 11-day relay across Greece, the flame will traverse historic landmarks before departing for France the next day. Arriving at this temple this morning, I was struck by the weight of history. For 2,800 years, there's been the same intensity, showing that while the world may have changed, sport still holds its significance. It has a vital role in bringing people together, fostering cohesion and promoting peace. It's a message of respect, tolerance and peace felt especially strongly here. It's incredibly inspiring and I'm grateful to have experienced this moment. On May 8, the flame is expected to arrive in Marseille, where up to 150,000 people are anticipated to gather in the city's old port for the ceremony. The French leg of the torch relay will spend 68 days, culminating in the grand lightning of the Olympic flame at the opening ceremony in Paris on July 26. The, uh, the Olympic Games, you know, they are the only event uh, which really brings the entire world together at one place and uh, competing peacefully uh, with each other. And this is uh, the, the great uh, symbol and the great uh, message. As Paris gears up to host the Summer Games for the third time in its history, after the 1900 and 1924, hopes are higher for a temporary cessation of armed conflicts and an Olympic truce during the Games, symbolizing the spirit of unity and peace. The end of our program, thank you for watching.